Um, okay, so my next question is about language. Um, this is open to any of you, whoever wants to jump in, but would anyone like to talk to us a bit about the importance of person first language? So for example, um, disabled person versus person with disability or wheel wheelchair user versus wheelchair bound? Yeah, so um, what a lot of people don't realize about person first language is that it started with the disability rights movement in the 60s and 70s. Um, there was a huge um, push to define disabled people as people first. And so that became kind of the baseline for the way we talk about disability. It was codified into the way that we write grants and for federal funding, the, the, the United States government requires person first language. Um, there are several organizations and um, financiers and philanthropy organizations that will refuse any sort of funding application if you use anything other than person first language. So that's really where person first came from. And so you'll find a lot of people who are older disabled people or a lot of people who are outside of the disability community utilizing person first language. Um, I think it's around people who were born around the 90s and later generally use uh, identity first language, which is saying, well, I don't need to remind you that I'm a person first, you should already know. Um, my lived experience is the first thing you think about when, when looking at me a lot of times. So that's where the identity first language came. It also it kind of pisses people off too. So it, that's why I use it um, because they have to really say you are a disabled person, meaning that I'm at the mercy of a system that actively disables me. I love that, Amani. Thank you. Uh, Dior or Ariel, is there anything you'd like to add? I would say that it, it, each person identifies differently. So if I were to be around someone where I don't know if they are, identi are identity first or person first language, I, I would be inclined to use person first and then be told whether or not it's uh, different and that it's identity first, but I'm totally open to other thoughts on that as well. Awesome. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ariel, there's no pressure, but if there's anything you want to get in on for that as well, please feel free. They covered it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm not even going to try to top that. <laughs> Okay, totally fine. Um, so I actually do have a question specifically for you, if you would like. Um, so whether or not you have read Ariel's memoir that I mentioned, um, you might have seen that she had a personal essay come out in Slate recently, uh, which I strongly suggest anyone and everyone read. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, um, I would love if Ariel could talk to us a little bit about um, what she shared there, which was um, Ariel wrote about not being able to afford hearing aids until she received a six figure book deal for her memoir, which is obviously terrible. Um, and I think has to do some with the systemic ableism that Amani mentioned earlier. Uh, so Ariel, if you would like to talk to us a little about that, I think it could be really interesting for the group. Yeah, absolutely. So I have uh, Cruzon syndrome, which is a condition where the bones in the head fuse prematurely. So from the time I was eight months old, I had surgery after surgery, basically expanding um, my skull and the bones in my face and just moving everything around. So because of that, my ear canals are kind of weird. Um, and so like, I can't get any water in my ears or I have, or I get an ear infection. And so I'm almost 31 now. So 31 years almost of chronic ear infections has led to a lot of hearing loss. And I was fortunate enough um, to have hearing aids when I was a kid because my mom had amazing insurance and her job went solely to cover my twin sisters and my uh, medical um, expenses. 
And so I, I was able to get hearing aids when I was little. Um, and then it would kind of fluctuate. And when I got to college, I really, it was very clear that I needed them again. Um, and I, I tried to go to a, a doctor, get hearing test, and it was gonna be thousands of dollars just for the initial test to figure out like, okay, what kinds I want. And I was like, how, how is this not covered, right? And hearing, hearing aids are considered elective, which just blew my mind. Um, and so I would sit in class and I had a note taker um, and I would have to go home after class. And like, I went to the University of Vermont, which was a very expensive school for out of staters. Like I'm paying that off for the rest of my life. Um, but anyway, um, to know that like I, I'm paying to go to college and sit in a classroom and now I'm going to have to go home and review all of these notes and that someone else took because I don't have any idea what someone is saying that doesn't feel like it should be okay like if I need hearing aids I should be able to get hearing aids anyway so I've had to rely on lip reading and things like that for years and it leads to a lot of really awkward situations in the slate article I mentioned my older sister was um getting married and I went with her to try on her wedding dress and she she tried it on and she was like does this dress look ugly on me or, or something like that she was just having a rough day and I was like yeah and she just starts crying and I was like okay I said something wrong right and so it's situations like that where it isn't just impacting my ability to hear and communicate it impacts my relationships it impacts the the opportunities that I'm able to get because if I'm not properly understanding what someone is saying and I have no way to interact with people in a way that works for me, where does that leave me? So in 2019, I was able to get a book deal and which was very exciting. And I'm so grateful that I was able to get a, a large advance because it really just went to paying for medical bills and hearing aids. And then once you have hearing aids, batteries and the filters and the checkup appointments, like it's it's very expensive to be disabled. And a lot of people don't realize how expensive it is. So that's my rant. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ariel. Um, also, I'm so sorry. Like that is such a long, hard nightmare. Um, but thank you for sharing that. And uh, of course, for all of the writing you do is so special. Um, going off of what Ariel just said about being disabled being like really expensive, um, if either Dior or Amani, if either of you um, want to like maybe share anything about like ableism as being like expensive, either in terms of access for events in person or remote, even um, academic opportunities, jobs, um, we would love to hear it. If that sparked anything for either of you. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things I think we don't talk about enough is that as it stands right now in the United States, disabled people pay for accessibility, despite it being a law. Nine times out of 10, we're coming out of pocket for um, our expenses. And I read an estimate that said about that disabled people pay about 28% extra of their incomes to just have the exact same quality of life as non-disabled people. I have a very si similar situation Ariel, where I have health insurance and my physical therapy is covered. However, um, most of our services are for children. So I was born with my disability and now that I'm an adult, I have to come up with additional reasons why I still need my disability cared for. Um, because I'm supposed to have grown out of it by now, I guess. So um, I have to pay, either pay out of pocket for physical therapy or I have to like injure myself and get physical therapy. But either way, it's extremely difficult to obtain services if you're an adult and if you're not on like a services waiver through your state, uh, state department. Thank you, Amani. And also, I'm so sorry too, that's so frustrating. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Dior, if it's not too much to put you on the spot, I was wondering if you could speak about um, like cost and mental health ableism, if that is something. Okay, thank you. 
Yes, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, it is expensive. If you don't have insurance, you usually have to pay out of pocket for therapy, and that can be upwards of two fifty an hour or more. Oftentimes, there are a lot of therapists who don't accept insurance at all, and so it, it really is unfortunate that with or without insurance, you might find yourself spending a lot of money on that. And in the past, I've had a therapist tell me that I had to prove that I was experiencing my mental illness because the insurance company was thinking, well, why is she still going to therapy? Does she still need therapy? So I felt like I had to act a certain way or say certain things in order to continue to get the care that I needed. So that just is extremely frustrating because it should be a right to be able to have access to mental health services. Thank you, Dior. Yeah, that is incredibly frustrating. And I think you just put it really well that it should be a right to be able to access these services. Oh, sorry. I think we have a question in the chat box from Erica. Um, is anyone else also seeing a pop-up that the meeting is being recorded? I am not. Um, Christine, if you're here, do you mind maybe troubleshooting with Erica in the in DM? Um, I, I'm not a Zoom pro, but one I would <laughs> try leaving and coming back, Erica. And I'm sorry um, for anything. Okay, I'm sorry. Again, Erica. Recording. <laughs> so. yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, and you guys, if anything like that comes up, please uh, don't be shy in pointing it out to us. Um, okay, so my next question is uh, a little bit of a different direction, uh, but I guess a little related. Um, so this will be two parts, one about in-person events resuming uh, and one about remote events. So conferences, talks like this, um, classes, so on. So I would love to hear from any of you um, about something that I've seen a lot on Twitter, especially, and TikTok, really important, um, that as in-person events resume during the pandemic, as some are starting to, to open back up, um, I'm reading a lot from people who are concerned that their access to these events will go back to essentially zero. Um, so for people or organizations who want to make their in-person events accessible, but don't know where to start, what advice would you give as like foundational things that organizers should have in mind? Anyone? Yeah, um, what I would recommend is that, sorry, I didn't want to, I didn't want to jump in. I'm usually very um, jumpy when it comes to these, the unmute button, but um, when it comes to planning events, what I would recommend is having disabled people start planning it um, first. Um, a lot of people like to think of us as an add-on or something nice to have around, but really don't think about us until the very last second. And so people are basically piecemealing accessibility on the back end rather than making it the foundation of their event. Um, Additionally, there are companies, there, there are disability consultancies that whose entire like purview is planning accessible events. Um, and there are several that worked with Crip Camp and things like that to host accessible event, events. So if you have the ability, hire disabled people. Um, we are equipped to do this work and we know exactly what we're talking about. Um, not me personally, but several other people. Um, but yeah, make sure that we're a part of the thought process from the ground floor. Um, and I can't speak to every single disability, but some of the basics are closed captioning, an ASL interpreter, having um, video relay and things like that. Um, and just as a note, I ran the numbers. I ran the numbers and about 12 million people are experiencing disability due to COVID-19. So there are people around you that need new and improved accessibility that they didn't need before the pandemic. And so we rarely ever, ever think about the fact that our entire culture has shifted even further into disability. Prior to the pandemic, our last count of disabled people was I think about 61 million. We represent a quarter of the population. And I think we represent now about 30% of the population. 
So having us thought of from the very first moment is exactly what needs to be happening. I love that, thank you. Um, actually, I wanna sort of jump off of something you just said. Uh, I was wondering if any of you wanted to talk a bit about, um, I guess what we're calling like long-term COVID or long-haul COVID, like this kind of collective change that's happening with more people uh, being disabled um, as a result of the pandemic. I would love to hear um, if you all have any thoughts about um, how things should or could be changing collectively, like in terms of social norms or work norms, um, like if this can be an opportunity for like a push for places to do better in the big picture when it comes to access. Dior or Ariel, if you want to start. I'll go. Um, so my gay job is actually working as an accommodation specialist at a university here in um, California. And one of the biggest requests that we've gotten is the like the request to stay remote. And so I think it says a lot that, you know, COVID happened and suddenly oh, now people can work from home and people can, now that it affects people um, who may not be disabled, oh, okay, now we can we can implement accommodations, no problem. People can work from home, we can figure it out. But now that everyone has just seemed to have decided that the pandemic is over and no nope, time to go back to normal, suddenly we can't do that anymore. Uh, I think this line of thinking is very problematic. Um, I know for me, like, I love that I still get to work from home. I'm way more productive. Being able to zoom into meetings that are now going back to being in person. And so now I'm on the outside again. And so I'm working from home, but the rest of my colleagues are back in person. It's hard. Now there's a barrier all over again. And so I think this is a great learning opportunity and a chance to remember that disability can happen to anybody at any time. We are all one exposure away from getting COVID possibly or something else. Um, and so just, again, keeping that in mind is really important. Allowing people to work remote, having captions, having interpreters. Um, if you have in-person events, have an online option. Like it isn't that difficult, it's doable. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, Dior, did you have anything that you'd like to share re like regarding this one? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that there will be more accessibility for people because now there's so many people who are experiencing long COVID. And I just think that it's unfortunate that a pandemic had to happen for people to start realizing that working remotely is something that is feasible and possible and that that doesn't uh, impact productivity in related relation to how often people think that if you are disabled or if you have a mental illness that you're not going to be as productive uh, but I'm I'm kind of digressing there yes. but uh yeah I echo oh, everything oh, like my uh, fellow panelists have said yeah yeah thank you Dior. and always honestly please do feel free to digress as much as you guys want um I think I can speak for everyone and that we're all like really glad to have you here. So uh, if I ever ask questions or like hint at something, but don't go all the way, like please feel free to just answer in the way that you feel is like most true to what you want to share. Like don't feel confined. Um, so my next question is, it's also about working remotely. Um, and since we're about 30 minutes in and because we're doing this as like a, a work call, right? Um, I would love to ask a little bit about um, confronting ableism in employment and in the workplace. Uh, so to give you guys some context, here at Daily Coast, we are a uh, basically a totally remote company even outside of the pandemic. Uh, so most of our communications happen on Slack or email or um, Zoom calls, that sort of thing. Uh, we're very rarely like face-to-face. -face. So if each of you are comfortable um, 
responding. I would love to hear any recommendations or even like a script or a starting point um, for people who hear or read ableist comments from a coworker, like how to approach their subject of their ableism virtually. Um, usually when I come across ableism virtually, I cuss people out regardless. <laughs> um, but um, I think one of the things that we, I think one of the things about the nature of disability that we don't often talk about is that ableism is so deeply ingrained into our society that we don't even know nine times out of 10 what is ableist. Um, I would say um, staying away from words like stupid, dumb, lame, those are all either, you know, considered slurs for disability or used to even be diagnoses for disability that we've now turned into insults. Um, so kind of staying away from those big ones, but also realizing um, that there's also there's teachable moments in these times and like letting people know, hey, I, I understood you, you said it, you know, I'm just letting you know that this is not considered, this is considered ableist that you're saying it. I mean, I would really appreciate it if you could watch your language going forward. Um, I think opening a dialogue with people is the best way, even though I'm not really good at that. <laughs> um, but making sure that people realize and have the opportunity to self-correct. I think the impl I think the instinct nowadays is to just kind of be like, Ugh. like just like cast people aside and be like, I don't want to deal with that person. But I think, at least for me, I want to provide people with enough grace, knowing that we all exist within a system that taught us to do this from birth. Right, like we've been taught to do this. We've been taught to look at disability this way since we were children. And it takes a little while for us to rethink the way and reframe the way we approach other people in our society at large. Um, but if they do it again, then I would cuss them out, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Ariel, do you have anything uh, that you'd like to share on this one? Yeah, just kind of uh, going off what Imani said, um, being open as well, if you, like there's a good chance that you're going to say or do something that is ableist at some point, whether you mean to or not, and being open to learning from that and not getting offended, not feeling attacked or called out, like it's not always about you. Mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes like feeling ashamed or embarrassed isn't fun, it's not fun for anyone, but part of doing the work and committing yourself to doing the work and learning is doing better. I'm sorry, thank you so much for letting me know. I will do better. Then then go out of your way and actually read up on it, learn about it, follow people just dis like disabilities and um, on social media, start reading different articles, research it yourself, um, really prioritize disabled perspectives and, and commit yourself to doing better. Yeah, so. I love that. Like between the those two comments, like I love the idea of both extending people grace and like accountability of like, okay, but like you also need to educate yourself and correct it and not yeah. completely do this. And I just wanna say things don't have to be awkward. Things are only awkward if you let them be awkward. If someone makes an offensive comment, responding back with, oh, hey, just so you know, that term's out of date. Here are some other examples. It doesn't have to be this big deal. If it's something that's super offensive, yes, absolutely have a conversation about it. But sometimes you can just have it be in passing. Mm -hmm. Hey, don't say that anymore, or that's not cool, or please don't use that word. It's only awkward if you make it. Yeah, I love that. Oh, sorry, Dior. Oh, no, it's fine, I should have my turn. Uh, <laughs> I, I completely agree uh, with what has been said and, and kind of going off of what Ariel said about an opportunity to be better. I think we really should be viewing it as our responsibility, but in an empowering way. It's our responsibility to do better, to educate ourselves so that we can be better versions of ourselves. So I think it's important to view it in a positive light versus I'm being attacked or I didn't do this right, but having it uh, be a learning opportunity. I love that. Thank you. Uh, Dior, you actually, the, the next question I have, I wrote with you in mind. Um, so I will open it up for Ariel and Amani too, but I would love to start with you, Dior, for this one. Um, so again, to give some context about where we work, um, 
our community, so like our readers, um, have the ability to write on the site as well. So like their articles um, are often like mixed with staff writers. Like when you view the front page or certain emails, like it, it's all kind of together, um, which is amazing in my opinion. But um, I think sometimes um, members of our community and unfortunately to be real, like progressives and Democrats in general, people in general, um, have a, I will say a habit of using mental health terms in um, derogatory or even speculative ways. And for our site that often has to do with um, calling out Republicans or calling out Trump, right? Like describing by, uh, a choice as bipolar or schizophrenic or speculating that someone has um, dementia and that's why they they acted this way something like that um, and I think a lot of our community members who do this struggle to accept that it's ableist because they kind of see it as like oh but like I don't mean it that way or I don't mean it about other people like I'm just saying it because it would bother Trump if he read it or like I'm just saying it um, you know like the old-fashioned meaning of it but they don't I feel like there's a little bit of a disconnect in helping them to see like why that is still harmful so I was wondering if Dior um, and Ariel and Amani if you guys have any like thoughts or suggestions on possible ways we could reach out or to to like massage that into a better collective understanding. I think we need to be a little more creative when it comes to our, our words, when we're describing people. Uh, and, and I, no one wants to be associated with someone who does really awful things. And I feel like when you use those specific terms, it kind of takes away that person's accountability where, uh, Sometimes people will say that racism is a mental illness and it will it, it takes away the, the, the onus of that person to actually change and do something about it. And so I think that we need to be more understanding, more open and refrain from using those words. So I, I understand that words like crazy uh, is very much part of our vernacular and it's something that we're so used to. But I think if we think about it in different ways, maybe using the word ridiculous or wild or giving specific examples of what that person did rather than just saying that that person is whatever the word is, stupid, for example. I love that, Dior, thank you. Uh, Ariel or Amani, would either of you like to jump in on this one? Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, it's not necessarily language, but I know that there are a lot of memes and images where um, like Trump's face, for example, might look distorted and disfigurement is used so much as like evil, everything terrible. Um, and so that really ties into, into it as well, the way we talk about and understand um, different things. So I just wanted to throw that out there because it is so exhausting scrolling through stories and seeing not only ableist comments and, you know, using derogatory slurs, but also, okay, now, ha ha ha, so funny. Now Trump's face is disfigured and his eyes are different and oh, okay. Like it, it, it's old, it's not funny. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's not exactly language, but I think it plays into the same thing. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, like memes and cartoons, definitely. So thank you for pointing that one out. Uh, Omani? Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, ableism is a tool of white supremacy. And so often we are seeing people tie extremist behaviors to disabilities in an effort to dismiss them entirely. When, when something happens, that, that shakes the system. What winds up happening is people try to tie it to disability to, to create the idea that that person is then disposable or should be, getting, should be gotten rid of. Um, we do this with mass shooters. We do this with um, Republicans, extremists. Um, and it's, it's the idea behind it that really bothers me the most. 
which is that simply by tying somebody to a disability means that then we can, we can then disregard them. We can discard of them. And so I think it's even, dip, even deeper than just, you know, the word choices itself. Like, why do you make that choice to tie somebody you don't like, somebody that you think is a horrible person to a disability? Um, and that we, we literally saw that during the pandemic play out. Um, people heard that only disabled and elderly people would die. And they said, oh, well, we'll be fine then, right? We'll be okay. But when you think about the fact that indigenous and black people have the highest rates of disability, it paints a, it shifts the entire picture behind that instinct. And so being careful to ask yourself why you're trying to tie somebody to disability is really where I want people to start th questioning themselves and really start to think deeply about why you need to use words for disabilities in order to, to um, describe what, you're, what you want to get rid of. I love that, Amani. Thank you. I actually, I was reading your, um, on your website, your article about um, white supremacy and disability the other day. Um, so I'm so glad that you mentioned that organically. Um, so for the next one, okay, just to give everyone a framing check-in, we have about 20 more minutes of me moderating. Is that right? Oh no, we have an we have almost an hour. Okay, so we have a lot more to go and then we'll have our Q&A section. Um, but if anyone does have questions while I am um, moderating, you can just feel free to ask them now too. I mean, I, I think that's fine. Uh, okay, so... Oh, here's a kind of big picture one that I think any of you um, would be like great to discuss. So anyone who wants to jump in, um, what would you tell activists or allies who don't yet recognize or understand why disability is part of every other social justice group or movement? Well, like I was saying, you know, it is, so deeply tied to white supremacy that it cannot be ignored. Um, I heard you talk about Democrats and progressives and all that stuff. Um, I know that when we talk about voting rights, it's incredibly important across intersectional lines. So for instance, in the 2018 election of uh, Stacey, between Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp, mm -hmm. what Brian Kemp did because he was also part of the election commission for that state was shut down polling places in predominantly black neighborhoods using the excuse that they were inaccessible according to the ADA. And so that's a voting rights issue that cuts across racial lines and disability lines. And like I said, understanding that thread in throughout all groups is incredibly important um, because we don't talk about it enough. And if we don't see it, we're not gonna address it. And if we're not gonna address it, then people can continue to use ableism and ableist structures to undermine the rights of socially and racially marginalized people. Nice, thank you, Amani. Uh, Ariel or Dior, would either of you like to jump in on this one? Rebecca, thank you. Sorry to cut either of you off, but Rebecca just shared about Stacey Abrams announcing her run for governor. So very exciting, thank you. Um, sorry, Dior or Ariel? I guess just following up with that, just saying how a lot, the majority of us, even if we may not identify as disabled, are disabled, and I think it impacts all of us one way or another. And so I think you can't just ignore that aspect of a person's identity. Yeah, and just to add again, how many, the large percentage of the population that does have a disability and how it intersects with every other identity, if you actually wanna reach people, like include, all identities. So. Well, I think data from the AAPD says that about 60% of households have at least one member with a disability in it. So even if you're not just counting disabled people themselves, that's a huge portion of the population, right? Yes, that is well. Thank you for, for bringing up that statistic. That's shocking, but also not, I guess. That's definitely good perspective.
So this is a, um, this is more of like a theoretical model question that I think could also be useful um, for all of us, especially those of us who work in um, writing or like public facing like activism for our site. Um, would any of you um, be comfortable discussing, um, I broke it down as the medical model versus the social model. So, um, basically seeing disabled people as something to be fixed versus um, like acceptance and celebration or accommodation. So for example, like deaf culture, et cetera. Um, so with the medical model, I just wanted to, to share a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is this idea that disability is something that needs to be fixed and, and basically conforming and growing up with Crouzon syndrome, like I mentioned earlier, um, I by the time I graduated from high school, I had over 60 surgeries to expand my skull, change what I look like. I can't even tell you which one of those were medically necessary and which one of those were just to try to get me to look more normal and fit in with society. That is incredibly traumatizing to grow up knowing on every level that the world around you thinks everything about you is wrong and that you it is better to undergo and interrupt every aspect of life miss school lose out on different friendships try to join clubs try to you know grow up with some semblance of normalcy only to oh no now you're gonna go have surgery again come back and you look completely different and oh but that's better than actually embracing your differences. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I just like to kind of share that because I think there's a little bit of a disconnect sometimes when we talk about medical model and it's this idea that, well, doctors know better and they just want to help. Mm -hmm. But if there's nothing medically necessary about operations and we're just telling people it's better to cut yourself apart and be stitched back together in a way that's prettier, mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of messed up, you know? And so um, I think this relatively recent switch to more of the social model where we are um, talking about how societal perspectives are the things that are disabling and not necessarily the conditions is really powerful. Um, especially working, you know, in higher ed and getting to work with disabled students all the time and having students come in and share with me stories about their own disabilities and talking about how um, the barriers impact them and really saying, you know what, it isn't you. You're right. It's not you. You're not the problem. The system is the problem. The barriers are the problem. Let's fix that for you. Um, so I, I think it's important to keep in mind that there are plenty of disabled people who like the way they look, who like their lives, who will have very full, rich, meaningful, beautiful lives in every sense of the word, and to assume otherwise is ableist. I love that, Ariel. Thank you. Um, Omani or Dior, would either of you like to share as well? Yeah, I think one of the things we need to think about, too, is that the medical model really does not um, lend itself to people of color. Um, if I go into a doctor's office and they don't believe me that I'm not feeling well, um, then I'm not gonna get treated that. So the medical model is kind of iffy when it comes to people who are racially marginalized. Um, and even, it's usually even an opportunity to incarcerate and to um, demonize people of color. Um, oftentimes children with disabilities uh, who are black especially, are either overdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, under it's it's a whole everything's just wrong when it comes to the diagnostic process and being black. And so going into a doctor's office and saying, oh, I need to fix you, it very rarely happens in a lot of those cases. And then there's also the fact that people, um, people within those communities don't want the diagnosis because it just means further marginalization and restrictions and barriers that they will not have to contend with. Um, when it comes to the medical model, it falls under what's called the individual model. Mm -hmm. um, and the individual model, there's several different categories like the charitable, the medical, the um, 
there's another one, but I can't think of it. But it, um, it's basically this idea that disability is the individual's problem and that society does not need to rise to the occasion to change its barriers. And that's the way the United States approaches disability. The fact that we have to pay extra for accessibility, the mm -hmm. fact that we have to pay extra for medical diagnostics, the things that we need. When in reality, the social model of disability is what's necessary, not even just that, but the cultural model of disability, which is now coming to prominence, which understands disability through an intersectional lens. And so I would, I would take every single model of disability with a grain of salt because it doesn't always apply to all. Can I just add something really fast that I wanted to mention um, that, you know, the comments that Imani made sparked this for me. Again, um, working in higher ed and having to assess medical documentation of students um, seeking disability accommodations, yeah, it's a great point to recognize that that is inaccessible for a lot of people. People have to pay to go to the doctor. It assumes people have health insurance that they can actually get documentation or afford to pay if their doctor or medical provider um, or mental health provider requires uh, a payment to have them complete a form. And so if there's any, you know, HR related um, folks on this call, maybe rethinking some of those policies for how employees um, request accommodations, maybe just start including captioning, including interpreters, things like that, and not requiring people to jump through these hoops to get the accommodations that they need. We should just believe people. If someone asks for something, give it to them. But even better, they shouldn't have to ask. So I love that because I tell every company I talk to, ask everybody. Accessibility should be the baseline. Everybody, as part of the onboarding process, everybody should be asked, hey, what can be done to make your job easier? What accessibility do you think you'd, be, you'd benefit from? This idea that we need to parse out and, and budget resources for accessibility when, when people are struggling, um, it doesn't make any sense. And then on top of that, you have the cultural issues of disability where people who need help who are otherwise marginalized will not ask for it because they don't want to be seen as useless or as lazy or um, as taking advantage of the system. Ask everybody what they need to, to be better and to succeed within your environment. Yeah, and I think it's just a violation of privacy. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to like yeah. jump in. I'm just like, oh, I'm getting all fired up now. Um, but it's a violation of privacy. Like I, I needed accommodations at my own workplace. I had to tell them about Curzon syndrome. I had to tell them about PTSD. I had to give them my entire medical history. I don't know these people. Like, I don't want to do, like, it's none of your business. If you want to know about me, go online and Google me. <laughs> I, like, I share enough, you know? Why do I have to have it now in my employee file read my book you know like if there's any doubt after that like that's your problem not mine um and then like to have to again jump through these hoops pay these people be vulnerable with people i don't know like that's just gross to me i don't know anyway i'll get off my my soapbox here but you just said something that i just almost forgot about which i think that um we also have to address is what's called forced intimacy, which is that disabled people often have to disclose so much to complete strangers to get the bare minimum of treatment. Um, like people are, people are asking us, people are grabbing at us, people are touching us. And we don't know these people, like with any other group of people, this would not be okay. And yet we're just kind of like shuffled back and forth and told, oh, this, this person needs to know this information for what, for what? And then you get the people that are like, wow, you share a lot. Or, oh man, you're oversharing. It's like, I don't want to. Yeah, no, I feel you. Oh, thank you guys. Oh, okay, I love that um, you guys are feeling comfortable like just talking organically. Um, so we do have someone who has a question, Sunita. Um, and then I do want to loop in Dior, if you're comfortable speaking to like the mental health angle of um, what Amani and Ariel were just talking about in terms of um, this like forced intimacy or like the how like self-disclosure for um, 
like accessibility, like at work, for example, um, can be like really tricky for people who might live uh, like with mental health disabilities or like invisible disabilities. Um, I don't, know. let me just ask Sunita, would it be better to have your question discussed before or after Dior shares? I don't know what their question is. So, okay. I, oh, you're Sunita, here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. There I am. Hi, everyone. Um, I Googled it. I found my answers. Oh. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm glad I've never used them, but I've heard them. I've heard some of those said to me in the past. So, yeah. My question was, um, what is an example of an ableist comment? So, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Do any of you guys want to respond to that before we loop back into mental health? Or as like a segue? Well, uh, oh, sorry. So, <laughs> uh, I, I would say that one of the, the things that people say is you don't look disabled and that actually often happens to people who have chronic illnesses who are that are invisible or people with mental illness and so they say it in terms of like it being a compliment uh, and then oftentimes people will question your disability and they won't believe it uh, and I think that kind of even taking it with a grain of salt, uh, I think that also goes back with the social medical model with how there is very patronizing when it comes to the medical model because the doctor knows better than you do when really in the social model, you are the expert of your own body because you are yourself. So you, you know what you need. Um, but yeah, I would say that that's uh, one, one or two examples of, of ableist language. Yeah, um, the one I get a lot is if I were you, I would kill myself, but you're so brave. Or like, if I were you, I would leave the house, but you know, you, you must be so, you know, feeling yourself or whatever. Or like you get, you must love all that special treatment. And I'm like, is this a special treatment? Cause I don't like it. Um, <laughs> so I get those types of comments a lot. Um, I get, you're so pretty for someone with a deformity, or do you think, or on the flip side, do you think you would be pretty if you didn't have a facial difference? And then I've been with my boyfriend for seven years and the number of people that treat him like he is a saint for being with me is so offensive. And I'm like, great. I'm standing right here. Thank you so much. Um, actually I'm amazing. Um, and so it, it's comments like that, that really do eat away at your, your self-esteem, your identity, uh, all that good stuff. So I could go on and on and on. There's a lot of really subtle ableist comments that people just love to slide in there. Yeah. I, I, I keep on doing this. I'm going to, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was just adding that, you know, I think we also need to think about the fact that like, ableism isn't just what you say, it's what you don't say. Um, a lot of times um, when I go out with like a family member or a friend, people won't even talk to me. They'll talk to the person next to me because they think that they're my keeper. We're like, where's your little helper? Like, I need to talk to an adult. I'm like, 30. Um, so um, that's also another big one. I get offered the kids menu, but my boyfriend and I have a date night and I'm like, thank you. I would love to color actually. That is all so terrible. Like, thank you for sharing because it's important that we all hear it, but it's truly terrible and definitely like systemic and so deeply embedded into social norms that I feel probably everyone has had a variation happened to them or seen it happen or or done it perpetuated it themselves um i think dior was going to say something though oh dior go oh yeah no problem thank you uh i i was just thinking uh about a personal story uh 
that I, I might have shared uh, with uh, during the last panel because it is uh, a microaggression. But I remember there was a period of time where I was unemployed and I had to deal with Medicaid and how inaccessible mental health services were with that experience. But again, I digress. But I, I had a period of time where I was unemployed and I was trying to get back into the field that I used to work in. And during uh, a phone interview, the interviewer said that they had looked me up and that they had learned about my work. And then they asked me, uh, he specifically asked me if I was going to be stable, mentally stable enough to do the job. And so those are, that's just another example of things that people will say to you or asking you what's wrong with you. And, and that can kind of go back to um, being in trauma formed where you say what hap happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. Thank you, Dior. Actually, if you don't mind, um, for those of us who aren't familiar with like what it means to be trauma informed, I know it's like a huge subject, but would you be able to give us just like a brief overview of what that might look like, like in terms of, I don't know, like medicine or, or even like organizing, like advocacy? Yeah, I mean, pretty much it's just going back to how trauma impacts people and how uh, that really impacts how they live, how they experience things and how it's important to be aware that people have experienced things. So being aware of the language that you use. So going back to saying like, what's wrong with you? Like that's that's putting the, the onus on them that there's something wrong with them when really it's something that they've experienced in their life. Nice. Thank you, Dior. Um, okay, so I, I see there are questions in the chat. Um, so I am just reading through quickly. Uh, are you three all okay with transitioning into the Q&A section now? Like questions from people who are watching? Okay. Um, I don't know who the first question was, but um, since Dior was just speaking, um, I will direct this to you first. Um, this is a question from Erna. Dior mentioned earlier how inaccessible mental health services are. I think about that a lot and how difficult it can be to get an actual diagnosis and how do folks with mental illnesses who can't get diagnosed actually get accommodated at work? That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, often if, if you, I mean, if it's part-time work, then it might be less likely that you'll have health insurance. Uh, but I think that talking about stress, I think, I think COVID is a good example of how we could use that in terms of accommodations, uh, but stress and, and other, other things that are not related to a diagnosis. I think that those are, are some ways that people can get accommodations, but also just, again, it being like an afterthought, like how about making those accommodations something that are is offered to everyone where people don't have to ask for what they need, but that they are already getting that in the first place. That makes a ton of sense, Dior, thank you. Uh, before, so Emily has a question. I don't know what it is, but before we move into that, uh, Ariel or Amani, do either of you want to like also try to answer the question or? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I know uh, in, in my work, when we meet with uh, disabled students, sometimes our intake and the conversation that we have can count as medical documentation. Like, for example, if a student, um, you know, and I know that this isn't necessarily like relevant to, to the workplace, um, or it could be, but if a student wants to bring their emotional support animal on campus, uh, mental health professionals like usually won't even write letters for that anymore. Um, and so, we have our own process. And so I think um, if there has to be a process with HR and getting those accommodations, it still does, again, require what Amani called the, the forced intimacy of, of revealing that information um, to people. But it's a really flawed process still, in my opinion, like just a 
personal example, um, and like I, I finally, after years, started antidepressants, right? Mm -hmm. So, which have been amazing for me. I tried them for years. I was allergic to them, put me in the hospital. Like it, it did not go well, but I'm also a rare case. But anyway, I tried them and I have years and years of documentation. My insurance won't cover it. They tried to say it was going to be $1,700 a month out of pocket. And so sometimes it doesn't matter from like the insurance standpoint, if you have documentation or not. And so that's why I think we really need to kind of work together and really keep our policies in mind um, and use, if there has to be something, use the conversations that you have with, with staff or student, whoever it is that's requesting an accommodation. Uh, it would be ideal if you could just make things accessible from the get-go, but if not, that's another way to do it. Yeah, and I, I work for a, a legal services agency for disabled people. So I work for what's called the Protection and Advocacy Network. Um, every single state has a protection advocacy agency for disabled people. You can call, talk to a lawyer, talk to an advocate, and they will, if, depending on, on what you need or what you request, they can potentially um, advocate for you with your employers or with your HOA or whatever it is. Um, what I will say is that there is a huge discrepancy between, um, like, necessary documentation of what the law actually says. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, there is no law, there's no list of disabilities. There's, it, and it literally makes space for self-diagnosis and new diagnoses. So for instance, long COVID, people will say that like long COVID is now a disability, but any illness is a disability. Any, it, the law literally says any impairment that affects your ability to um, perform daily tasks. So that it really doesn't have much except for, if this is difficult for you to do, that's a disability. Um, so, but in terms of like getting people to believe you, it's much, much harder. And it still boggles my mind that a lot of places still ask for documentation and then have never read the law because if they read it, they would be like, oh, okay. Um, I, I'm legally required to offer this even if, you know, they don't have an official diagnosis. And that's why like, we try to say when we have a conversation with a student documentation or not like I always tell students if you have documentation great because I'm not a doctor and I want to be able to help you in the, the best way that I can and if they have ideas for accommodations that like you or I might not think of wonderful but otherwise tell me what you're experiencing tell me the barriers and let's talk about ways that we can remove them that counts as documentation if if that's something that you're like no we need proof have a conversation, like, believe people. Ariel, since you were just speaking, um, this is sort of related. It's a question from Elaine. Um, I would like to hear more from Ariel about transitioning students out of the university system into the workplace and what issues are seen getting graduates job interviews and jobs and if there are any services around that. Also, how can employers recruit effectively in these communities? You know, we have um, a lot of students who go on to apply for jobs and we'll put that they are disabled in their application back. So that is a very um, unfortunate reality that there is a deeply ingrained belief that to hire disabled people is going to be expensive or they're not going to be able to perform as well, things like that, which is just simply not true. Mm -hmm. um, the transitioning students out of the university system into the workplace I don't really have as much experience about with that, to be honest. Um, a lot of the students that I meet with um, come to me when they need accommodations or adjustments to their accommodations, and then we'll reach out if they want, um, you know, a note from our office saying that they what accommodations they were approved for. If they want to take, you know, a graduate school entrance exam or go to grad school. Um, 
but I really, that's a great question. And honestly, it's making me reflect a little bit on, on the work that I do and the role of uh, my office on campus, because we really should be supporting students more in that way. Um, I know that like the career center at the university has like interview practice and things like that. And we do work with students with like academic coaching. And so, you know, planning and holding yourself accountable, how to get everything done and prioritize tasks, things like that. Um, and then um, connecting students with community resources, uh, like there's a community center for the blind, for example. And so that way they have access to resources and community once they graduate. So I think that's another um, aspect of the experience in college for some of our students is they have a, a network and a support system. And so once you graduate, that's gone. Um, but yeah, I think employers can start recruiting more by maybe even reaching out to some of the disability offices on campus. We do have some organizations that do that when they are hiring. And so we can put out a memo to our students of, hey, here are some internship opportunities. Here are some job opportunities. And they won't have to worry about I don't know, masking whatever their disability is or trying to present themselves as a certain able-bodied person when that's not their reality. They can just be them, their full selves. And so another aspect of recruiting people with disabilities is being aware of what that means and being inclusive, being accessible and not making it a show, but just doing it because you should the unique perspectives and ideas that disabled people can bring is incredible. And so it's gonna, it's a benefit for you. It's not, oh yay, we're diverse. We're now, you know, recruiting disabled people. You should be doing that anyway, because you just should. So that's my answer. Did I, did I cover that? Imani, oh, you look like you have something to add, go ahead. Oh yes. Um, so, um... I work in communications. And so uh, one of the things that uh, we, we look out for is that um, we look out for transition age adults uh, with disabilities and kind of guide them toward uh, transition age, but also usually 18 to 21. Um, what, one of the things I would like people to keep an eye out for, especially if you're black, is if you have somebody who's in special education and is about to graduate, make sure they get their GED and not a special diploma. Um, a special diploma is not a GED. Uh, which means that um, they'll basically be filtered into the system and it's legal to pay disabled people below the minimum wage and it's even easier if they do not have their GED or that certificate. Um, another thing is that if you want to recruit disabled people, there are what's called centers for independent living across the country. Um, they, are, they were started out of the disability rights movement and the independent living movement out of Berkeley, California. And so they're each kind of like county or region, depending on what your state is like um, has a center for independent living and you can kind of connect with them about recruiting disabled people. There's also job boards on disabilityscoop.com. There's also AAPD, the American Association for People with Disabilities. They also have their own job boards. Um, Lord have mercy, I just I had the, I wanna, oh yeah. So the language like in your application also needs to reflect that you're not trying to filter out disability. So one of the things that people love to put in job applications is must be able to lift like 25 pounds. And it's it's a writing job. Like why would I need, add the pencil, that's it. Um, so people will specifically put language into applications to filter out disabled people. So make sure you're taking a second look and actually putting tasks on the job description that actually are relevant to the position and not just as a deterrent for disabled people. I love that from both of you. Thank you. Um, 